Thanks, Tim. Thanks to the choir, too. You all did really well without Scott today. Scott had an emergency in Indiana. That's why he's not here today. But Jay and our good man, Tim, have pulled it off. Thank you. So, thank you. I would like to also thank Rick. Rick, you know, um, one of the things we've struggled here for years is to try to dis succinctly describe who we are to everybody. And you did it so well for Habitat, it's, you've raised the bar again for us, so thank you for doing that. And thanks for being here. Um, okay, I, I, there's many things I could say about Habitat right at the moment, but we'll just save those for our experience of being part of it. How about that? Um, this book uh, called Lost Gospel of Q is what I'd like to talk about today. Q comes from the German word quell, which means source. Quell is the source of the sayings that are in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. So this was more or less discovered as a, a missing gospel that by someone about 150 years ago who was studying the gospels they had realized that the order of the gospels writing was mark and then matthew luke and then john that scholarship had come that far and then this guy put the gospels of luke and matthew side by side and saw that what was different from mark was the sayings that were in there the the, the words of jesus that were found in both Luke and Mark, I mean Matthew, and they did not believe at that time that the two had known each other or read each other's work, so that there must have been another source for the sayings. And that source, being in German, was called Quell, and now it's just come down as Q for us. So the book of Q basically has only the sayings in there, or only the part that was common to both Matthew and Luke that was not in Mark or the other Gospels. It's just so more or less all you get here is sayings. You don't get story. There's no creation. I mean, there's no uh, birth uh, story. There's no, no crucifixion in there. It's just his sayings. So it's the teachings of Jesus, not the story of Jesus. Now, this source was thought to be, have been written in 50 AD, so about two decades after the death of Jesus. And before the other Gospels were written, which start with Mark, uh, and those were about two more decades later, so starting in the 70s and then the 80s, 90s, or even around in the 100s. It was not exactly sure what, what year they were done, but they all come much later. And so essentially, this Q source was what the early Christians kept with them. And they studied these or tried to live by these sayings long before there was a gospel that had the story of Jesus' life in it. And the interesting thing about the gospels was this is one of the early books. Prior to that, there had been uh, more in the scroll way of keeping things, and so the Jewish tradition was to have the gospel, I mean, the, the Bible on the scroll, which was a bit more cumbersome than, say, a codex, which is the beginning of the book uh, era, when you write it on pages and it's folded together and you can go one page after the other. And then if you've ever seen one of these codexes, the, um, they tend to be small, they tend to be something you can carry, and they tend to be written absolutely from border to border without any paragraphs or gaps between sentences and lacking punctuation. You just have to figure it out when you stop. And so the, the Q source was most likely like that, although they have never found one single book that, has, that is the sayings book that they, were, they, they call the Q. So it's an inferred gospel. But the beauty of, a, of a, a gospel like this, which is just sayings, is that you kind of extract all the 
story and you get right down to what Jesus is teaching and you can read the whole thing in an hour. Um, there's, I'm not sure how many pages in here, but maybe about 70 pages each one has a short paragraph. You can run right through it. You can get Jesus' ministry in, in about an hour. It's <clears throat> pretty cool. <laughs> and one of the things you notice if you read this, and you can, since you can read it in an hour, you, it's pretty easy to spot kind of three categories of Jesus' teachings. One would be what I call spiritual teachings, one would be societal teaching, and one would be the you better duck, you're in deep trouble teachings. Now, I'm going to put the last category aside for the moment and come to the spiritual teachings. So the spiritual teachings largely are talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, this realm which many people may stook for being a physical realm. That, that at some point in the very near future from Jesus' time, something was going to radically change and there would be... Um, the world order would change. And I'm sure that had been a hope for the Jews for quite some time. They had been occupied by successive empires, and they were at this point when Jesus comes along in which they are expecting a Messiah to deliver them politically and militarily from their oppressors. Jesus comes and says, hey, I am not that guy who's going to do the fighting. I am the spiritual guy, and I want to tell you that the real purpose here is to go deeper. And as I said, I've said before, you know, it's really easy to understand the kingdom of heaven if you're a Buddhist, but not if you're a Christian. Because we tend to get them confused and we come out of this Judeo-Christian tradition in which God acts in history instead of just simply a, a spiritual quest. And so that confusion, I think, has stuck with us throughout the, the history of Christianity. But I think if you take his sayings and you look at them deeply enough, you really they're really talking about going into a deeper, more expansive state of consciousness, not, not so much about the world. That's one section. And then the next section of sayings that you might say, they don't come sequentially, but the next category to talk about would be his commentary on society at that time. And he's pretty harsh. He's tough on people, especially people in power, especially Jewish people in power. He, he, he has a lot to say against them, and he has just a lot to say against people in power, period. And then the final one, that final category, is a statement which says, if you don't listen to me, you're going to hell, essentially. Like any parent, when you get to the point where they are just not listening, then you raise your voice, right? And you start making threats. So that's essentially how I think it goes. It, frustration level was high enough that the, he said, well, I'm just pulling out all the stops. I'm just going to really let you all have it. <clears throat> but I think the core of what starts with Jesus is this deep experience that he had in which he becomes to the point where he would call God Daddy, which is a fairly big break from the Jewish tradition he grew up in where God is more authoritative and distant and powerful. Daddy kind of implies sitting on the knee of, being in the lap, being in the heart with. This is God as sweet. This depth that he goes into allows him to go deep enough to begin to see that God is imminent everywhere. The kingdom of heaven is among you, is everywhere, but he is also realizing that with that, he has enormous compassion for everyone, that the other is not so present in his life, other as in, the tax collectors, for instance, the Samaritans, the woman caught in adultery, these are often the other in that society. And they, they are not other to Jesus because now he is in the heart space. He is in this connected place. So once his, once his depth was enough in the 
in the spirit world, his death in the human world was also unavoidable. This, I think, is why Jesus speaks so much about taking care of the poor, about uh, loving your neighbor as yourself, about forgiveness, about settling your differences with your, your uh, adversaries before you go to court, about being humble, about if you're poor, you will be satisfied, if you mourn, you shall be comforted. He speaks to the human condition because he is so deeply in touch with his own spirituality. Now, I've often heard this phrase, you don't, don't be so spiritual that you're useless. <laughs> and I don't think this happened to him. He was d uh, spiritual enough that he was quite to the point that though life is not about material goods, if you have, you share. If you can, you help. And you don't put yourself over and above and against others. And most importantly, don't make life worse for somebody else. This was a simple teaching. This is what you get when you read the whole thing all at once. You just boil it down to one sentence. Just be nice, like your mama said. <laughs> be nice. Care about other people. But more importantly than, than just doing the right thing, be right in your heart. Be right in your heart. See others in the same way that you would want to be seen. Love them, even though they may not appear to deserve it. Transcend the differences. Be right there with them. That's the gospel, the social gospel. And then act accordingly. Act accordingly. Now, one of the interesting things that happened uh, yesterday um, Nancy and I went downtown <clears throat> to the LBG, well, to Out Raleigh. Uh, we went to that cere uh, celebration of life. And I just don't like street fairs, period. I don't like being in crowds. I don't like the feel of it. Sometimes my introversion is... I don't pay attention to it, and I go anyway. <clears throat> Yesterday I went anyway. And I, Fran had been there all day. She'd been there since 8.30, and she was catching me up on what had happened. And she said there was a, a group of, <clears throat> from a church, I won't call them Christians yet, but I, there was a group from a church that came in and told everybody they were going to hell. Now that kind of comes at the last category of Jesus, you know, <laughs> things. <It's> like, <clears throat> And what I found really interesting, and they were there when I was there, and it was almost 4 o'clock. They were there, still banging their drum and had the microphone going, but I can guarantee you nobody was listening. <laughs> and I found it really interesting that it had gone from the point where people felt like they needed to push against that to where you just don't even need to hear it. You don't even care. There were other churches there. We were there. Um, it was a, a, a nice group of People, everybody was happy and was doing the street fair thing. And I'm sure if Jesus was here, he would have been with us and not with them. That's just the way I think of you. Really. <clears throat> because I think, you know, if anyone would take in tax collectors, and just to, to put the finer point on it, what a tax collector was, a tax collector was somebody who worked for the mafia and extorted people to his advantage. So the whole system, of the Roman system of taxation was that you conquered an area, you set up a, a, a Vici government there, and you taxed people, and you sent the money to Rome. And so it was very much, uh, the money flows uphill. And if you're on the bottom end, if you're poor, you're really getting it from every direction because there's a tax for everything. And, and the tax collectors don't answer to you. They answer to the, their authority, and they have their fiefdom. And the more they can extract from it, the better for them. And so tax collectors were just universally despised. 
because they were your people treating you badly. These are not easy to love when you have widows and orphans that are going hungry and the tax collector is asking for more. <coughs> Jesus was friends of tax collectors. That's saying a lot, right? That is transcending your human state, that human state of separateness, and seeing the depth of who we are as human beings right through that. That even the tax collector needs love, needs God, needs to be forgiven, needs whatever it, people need as human beings. That's, that was the case. So one of the things I just want to say about our community, which I think it's nice to be told something that you already know about yourself, that essentially we are an open community which invites all people here and tries to make no distinctions that say you do not belong here. I have noticed that people who feel a lot of prejudice don't feel that good here, so I think we're, we tend to be bigoted against prejudiced people. <laughs> but we're working on it. <laughs> because we would too would like to be able to say to all people, including the people that do not seem to be thinking right, you're God's precious children as well. You too are one of us. I have been trying to say this and trying very hard to convince myself to, to do it. Um, but when crazy things are said, mean things are said by other people, about other people in public, which seems to be going on pretty rampant these days, not to take um, too much umbrage that I cannot see the humanity inside those people, right? You can just tell by the language, those people right there, I haven't made it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but I'm working on it occasionally, anyway. So this idea that we open our hearts is, seems to be part of the spiritual experience. This part of what Jesus, the great way shower would say is like, you know, come with me and carry your own cross. Now, so there is something to be lost in your arrogance going dead. You, you may not, it may feel like you're losing something when you don't have your solid ground to stand on that I'm right and you are so wrong. But that's our cross to bear. I'm hoping there's a breakthrough in here for me because I'm not in liking this uncomfortable state I'm in around this, but perhaps there is. Perhaps the reason it's gone to such an extreme is it's time for us to break out. Really, to be radically different. To let the kingdom of heaven be so profoundly true inside of each of us that when we walk in the world, we can see the kingdom of heaven is among us even though just yesterday we didn't think so. That's the kind of awakening I would like to have, where I can feel it and know it to be true and not stumble in my journey in that direction. So Jesus awakened, spends his time awakening. He then makes commentary on the nature of society which is basically the same commentary that, we, uh, that uh, many of the commentators today are making. It's messed up, right? Followed by, if you don't fix it, all hell is going to break loose. So we don't want to get to this end of it. We want to come back, I think, to come back to the beginning here and to find a way to know ourselves at depth. And this is where prayer and meditation become so important because just living in the outer world, it's difficult, it's difficult to see beyond it if you haven't had the glimpses that come with your eyes shut. Because somehow with your eyes shut, when the, when the 
the reality of the physical world is not so imminent and present in our minds, we have the ability to drop into a deeper understanding and to see differently. And so we advocate prayer and meditation here, and we say without that, you can live a good life, but you're probably, though not necessarily, probably going to be limited to the conditioned life of society that you live in. So to awaken, you need to break somehow from this patterning that is given to us on a consistent and nearly constant basis by the outer world and begin to see beneath it. And from there, then you begin to act in a way that comes naturally to you to act with generosity and kindness. And I think that's the Jesus gospel right there. Now, after Q was written, or more or less at the same time, there was another guy that was on the scene, uh, uh, Paul, the apostle. And Paul didn't write a gospel, but he did write a lot of letters to the churches. And Paul has a lot of theology and a lot of ideas about how to interpret Jesus' life. And that became more or less the dominant model of Christianity after the early, early Christianity, maybe after the first century. But it began to be the Christianity. And, and it's not really sure that Christianity would have existed or, or we would even know the name of Jesus had it not been for Paul. So in some ways, you have to give Paul kudos. But on the other hand, I just don't like what he did with the Met Place. You know, I think he set up a structure that is... I've never been comfortable with Paul. I used to read the Bible every day as a teenager. And I'd get to the... I was great with the Gospels. I'd get to Paul and I'd start to grind my teeth. <clears throat> and I have not outgrown it. <laughs> so, what I would like to say is that, in essence, we are... Uh, we, this unity, is a Q community, not a Christian community. Not a Pauline Christian community. And it's why when people ask you, are you a Christian organization, we say, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> right? So, <clears throat> so I think it, as, as a Q community, it all makes sense to us. You know, we're not in the sin-salvation paradigm, which is what Paul was in. He was, he was a, um, a merchant originally. And Paul saw, understood the world from debt and repayment, from exchange. And so Jesus' death had, was explained by Paul as a, as a price paid for mistakes made by all of us. It makes sense to him. And it's a good metaphor, but I don't like it. I think Jesus' life was more about his teachings than the story that was added to those teachings. And therefore, we as a community have always said, you know, we're a follower of Jesus' teachings, right? That little nuance in there where we are Christians following the teachings of Jesus, or we are Buddhists following the teachings of Jesus, or we're Hindus, or we're whatever. We are unity people. We're unitics following the teachings of Jesus. So maybe that ticks should be U-N-I-T-I-Q-U-E, unitics with a Q in there. <laughs> so... This is, our, this is our tradition. And so if you, with some pride, you can say, well, I go back to the beginning. I go back to the original teachings of Jesus, and I, live, I come from there. And one of the things I think is true is that when you do that, you find that there is a commonality with other religions, other places. So you could go to a Buddhist text, and you might find the same sensation or, of reading it that you would from uh, reading the, the Gospel of Q. Or you might... You might see the wisdom in that you would find in Hinduism or, or even other less well-known religions. The core is the same, the heart. 
The heart of the matter is the same. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Whatever, however the best you understand that. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And be sure you learn how to love yourself. That should be the third sentence, but it forget, they forgot it. Love yourself. Love your neighbor. Love your God. However you understand that. That's the gospel. And it's not about, in my opinion, it's not about believing certain things. It's unfolding who you are. This is what it's really about. And so you come to a, a, a organization like Habitat who says, okay, you know, we, we're Christians, but we really believe that anybody who wants to help make this world a better place will take you, especially if you can swing a hammer <laughs> or you have some money or you know how to cook or you're willing and able to do something. Please come and help. Throw yourself at the problem. And the problem is we have forgotten how to be in touch with each other. And part of that, I just read an article by Wendt, a, a quote by Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry says, basically this agrarian world that we used to live in, we had things, lots of things. Well, some things anyway. And we, when somebody needed it, we came over with our things and we helped them. Now what we have are stocks and bonds. Hard to bring your stocks and bonds over right? You're in a derivative world. The modern world is a derivative world. It's not the world, it's the derivative. What's more important, stocks and bonds or a plow? Right now, it's stocks and bonds. Therefore, we have come one step further by our economic system. We have gone one step further away from each other. So consciously, we must return to helping and sharing because the nature of things have changed so much. The world we live in is radically different. We do not go to each other's house and raise a, a barn. We cannot share a mule. It's different. So we must work at being in community with each other because we are in a world that is not designed like it used to be. So this is, this adds weight to the need which is so prevalent here is to find community. Kurt Vonnegut said, what should young people do? Well, they should do many things, but one of the most daring they can do is create real community. That's where we are. The world has changed a lot. We can't be accidental in our community like we used to. We must choose. So, to be a whole human being, Love God with all your heart. Act as though you're one with humanity. And certainly, be humble. Be humble. For if you're prideful, Jesus will have got some bad words for you. <laughs> be nice, be humble. Engage the world as though you're its neighbor. And do your best to find depth in your life. This is my reading of the gospel. So let us pray. Begin by opening to the presence which is all about us. Let's just begin with that thought. I open to wisdom and love pouring in and through me and as me. This is a can be done by intention. Now let us go deeper and begin to feel into our hearts where we can find both the finger of God and connection with each other. And invite the hand of God to open your heart more fully. 
open our hearts that we might love without reservation. or protection. open our third eye, our eye of intuition, our awareness of seeing without the eyeballs and see the world around you. And send that love that you found in your heart out to all that you see. power of thought and prayer, let us say a blessing for everyone everywhere. And may we too awaken so fully that we know ourselves as one with God and each other. Thank you.